So 4 inches underwater and there's supposed to be a shed fighting in front of a camera just 10 inches away. But can you see anything? What if it's all wrong from the very beginning? Hello, welcome back and Happy New Year! Now, water clarity or visibility is critical for fishing and it is in general across almost all techniques because a lot of the predator fish we're targeting are visual feeders. The water clarity significantly affects their strike zone. In every fishing trip before I cast out my line, I'll just dip my rod tip into water and decide whether it is one foot or a couple inches of water visibility. And I think this is what we have been told how to decide water visibility. And this visibility factor actually goes really deep into our decision making, including lure choices, line size determination, technique choice, and presentation style. And the list actually goes on and on. But what if it is all wrong from the very beginning? Let's time travel a couple of months back and our destination is Lake Ontario in late June. And it was prime time for smallmouth bass spawning activities. Now I came across this bed in about 3 to 4 feet of water. Both the male and the female smallmouth were on the bed and they were not shy to my boat at all. So let's anchor down and enjoy some first row bass po um, um, I mean close observation of the spawning behavior of smallmouth bass. And the water was gin clear and you can see every single action of the fish just by standing on my front deck. So what visibility do you call this water? Now if we use the rod tip method, you can probably dip an entire 15 feet 10 color rod fully extended and still see the rod tip down there if we have enough water depths. Now I'd say at least a 10 feet plus visibility if we really want to assign a number. Well, just watching from distance is not very exciting, isn't it? Now let's drop the GoPro to get some close action from underwater. Do you see this big rock on the bottom right corner of the bed? This is where I will be planting the GoPro underwater and the lens will be facing this direction. And here we go. So we can see Mr. and Mrs. Smallmouth dancing on their bed. But you all probably have already noticed, when they are circling, at the far end of the bed, we already lost all the details of the bass. We cannot see their face, their color pattern. All we have left are two fish-shaped silhouettes moving around. Now the bed is about three fish lengthwise, and our Mr. and Mrs. Smallmouth are about two pounds apiece. So let's say they are 15 inches in length, so really the distance of the camera to when they are at the far edge of the bed is no more than about 50 inches or around 4 feet at most. But remember, when we were looking down from the boat into the water, we can clearly see way better and way more details of the fish, way more resolution. And if you think about the water depth, which is also around 4 feet, now why would a gin clear water, uh, something like a 10 feet plus visibility, all of a sudden turn into less than 4 feet visibility underwater? And this is exactly what we are talking about today. Now our definition of water visibility is simply not representative of the actual underwater visibility. It is actually detached from the underwater reality in most cases, and here is why. The water visibility is highly dependent on the interaction of lighting condition of water with the actual water clarity. And for natural light during daytime we are focused on, the lighting condition includes mainly the brightness of the sun and the relative location and angle of the sun toward the target. Now, when we are checking water clarity using that rod tip method, we would naturally position the sun behind us. And similarly, when I was videotaping the smallmouth bed from my boat, I had a sun really behind me. Otherwise, we cannot really see through the water surface due to the reflection and the flare if we have the sun ahead of us. And secondly, when checking on the rod tip dipped in water or looking at the smally bed, we were looking down. So the sun is aligned right behind our target, which is the rod tip or the bed in the water. And you can see from the animation, it's 
close to the sort of like a double alignment of the sun, which is the light source, to our observation point and to the target. Now, this is a close to the optimal lighting condition to see through water from above. But this optimal condition is a luxury only for human beings to have above the water, and it is a further augmented by polarized sunglasses nowadays. But underwater, when we drop the GoPro, the sun is not directly behind it anymore, and as I mentioned, the lens is facing up left to the bed, which is now in an angle with the sun. Now, furthermore, our target, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smallmouth, is pretty much horizontal relative to the camera. So the sun, again, is not really aligned with the target to provide the best lighting condition for seeing through. Or in other words, the GoPro does not need to look down onto Mr. and Mrs. Smallmouth. They are pretty much parallel on the same water depths. So the situation of our GoPro is actually very similar to the daily routine of fish underwater. Now, fish don't necessarily always have the opportunity to position the sun behind them, although in some cases they really tend to, and this will be another topic. And unless they are staring down, the sun is almost always not directly shedding light on the target from behind the fish. That's one major reason why the actual water visibility underwater is almost always worse than what we perceive from above water. Then there is the particle factor. Now this is what I call the actual water clarity. The more small particles floating in the water, the less actual water clarity. And you probably already noticed the amount of little particles in the so-called gin clear water on Lake Ontario. And those little particles come from debris, sediment, the vegetations, and other aquatic creatures. And the problem is they scatter and absorb light. Now, to be able to see the objects, as long as the object is not glowing from itself, now we need the light source to shed light on the object, and then some light gets absorbed by the object, and then some light gets reflected into the eyes of the fish, to the eyes of us, or into the lenses of the GoPro. Now, this portion of reflected light from the object, once in contact with the floating sediment particles, gets scattered and absorbed resulting in a loss of contrast, and basically everything looks like it's covered by a dense layer of fog. Now, the part that surprised me was, water as clear as that from Lake Ontario still already contains huge amounts of these little particles. Now, I thought before I dropped that GoPro into the Ontario Lake, clear water is something like water from a swimming pool, but no. You can clearly see all the small particles here are floating around, actually not just very closely hovering on the bottom, but actually floating really high. As the brightness of the sun changes, the scattering factor also varies. You can see on the left is when there were some clouds shielding the sun, and on the right is when the sun was completely out. The water looked more turbid or even slightly milky on the right. But this is still the same gin clear water when we look from above. Now, if I did not see these underwater clips within the natural elements, I would never have imagined just how much variable the underwater visibility could be. And apparently, we cannot pick up these variables that impact the underwater visibility by looking down at the raw tip from above the water. And talking about the sediment impact, uh, let's look at another clip. Uh, this is another Jane Clear water situation about two to three feet deep. It started like this. Uh, but then wind picked up, and in a matter of a couple of minutes, you can see the wind-driven currents start to stir up the sediment on the bottom. And a couple of minutes later, the water clarity is totally different now. Now, what this tells us is, we need to keep in mind that under some conditions like shallow water or water visibility is actually easily affected by elements like wind, and together with the sunlight angle and height, water visibility can change in a matter of minutes. Now, we have probably all run into a scenario when a shifting wind immediately impacts the bite, or maybe shut that down or maybe make it better. Now, lots of factors could contribute to the bite change, but now I'd say we should consider the possibility of water visibility change as well. And other than wind, Another natural element can stir up sediment and cause chaos of underwater visibility. 
that is, the changing temperature of the water. Now specifically, when a turnover happens due to the changing temperature of water, which leads to water density change at different depths, which eventually then lead to a gigantic mixing event from top to bottom, sediments get stirred up pretty bad. Now, spring and fall can both have turnovers, and when that happens, fishing can get really tough. Now, sure enough, the temperature factor is one of the reasons why fishing gets tough during those periods. But the visibility chaos caused by mixing is for sure playing another key role here. Now, just imagine the underwater clip we just saw, which is the wind disturbing the sediment from the bottom. And times that a billion times, and that's a scale of a quick turnover. Now, knowing what's really going on about underwater visibility allows us to make changes effectively and quickly. Strategies such as increasing the visibility of a lure either by adding visual attractions or by adding sound and vibration makes even more sense after seeing these underwater clips. And in clear water, we tend to go super finesse. And sure, water may look gin clear from above, but now that we know the underwater visibility can be a very different story, maybe we don't need to be restricting ourselves to the super finesse repertoire like drop shot and jig head minnow all the time anymore. Maybe that super hard jerkbait bite in clear water on windy days were because the water was not clear to begin with. Now, talking about sediment, here is another clip, and our curious Mr. Smurmouse in this case came directly at the camera. And I want you to all pay attention to how the sediments got stirred up so easily by Mr. Smurmouse's pectoral fins, and how the localized water clarity changes due to these sediments. Actually, if we we'll go back to the previous clip, look at all the sediment particles floating around. The wind that day might have some contribution to this, but also our Mr. Smallmouth has been really busy swimming back and forth, going after gobies, dancing with Mrs. Smallmouth, and chasing off quagmire. So the fish activity has to be a factor for stirring up all these sediments, and similarly, props of a boat or trolling motor and a lot of other activities in the water will do the same. Now overall, this is a bottom with sand and rocks mixed. It's a hard or semi-hard bottom typically associated with clear water from our typical bass fishing knowledge. And you can see there is a thin layer of moss and sediment covering the bottom. But if just this much of sediment can stir up that much of the turbidity by the fish, imagine what happens when the bass is swimming around the muddy bottom? Or is this one of the reasons why bass prefer hard bottom? Before we end today, let's look at the difference of water color versus water visibility. So a lot of my local lakes has a tan brown-like hue thanks to the billion tons of vegetation from forest and underwater. Now when leaves start decaying in the water, it creates this tan color. And it looks really dark and I used to think this means low water visibility. But what is the actual underwater visibility in this type of water? Look at this. Now this is actually not too bad at all, and you can easily get 4 to 5 feet sideways in the water. And when the light source is aligned well, you will get all the details from the jerkbaits. So the bottom line is, the water color is a separate concept from water visibility, and this is to be distinguished from muddy water. The muddy water is like chocolate milk, and this is how it looks like under muddy water. So 4 inches underwater and there's supposed to be a shad fighting in front of a camera just 10 inches away. But can you see anything? So the take home message for today is, the actual underwater visibility is almost always way worse than what we see from above. We can probably still use that rod tip trick to check water clarity, but I'll definitely treat it with a at least a 50% discount. And I'll also be aware of the impact of bottom composition, natural elements like wind, sun angle, sun height, and a temperature change. And those have a big impact on the underwater, the actual water visibility. And we'll keep observing the elements closely every time on the water. And a lot of things like lighting conditions in the water are for sure worthy detailed discussion in the future. 
Now initially I was planning to do some follow-up video um, on the jerkbait tricks today, but I couldn't find some key unknown clips. I knew I have it, but it's definitely buried somewhere in these hard drives. And it seems a little bit difficult to shoot another underwater video right now in New England because everything pretty much freezes up. So we will have to wait a little bit, unfortunately. Uh, by the way, the 2026 JDM Tackle Expo is coming up in a week and the big names are going to reveal their full lineup for 2026 next Friday. And most likely our next video will be focusing on the tackle topics. And with that, tight lines, and I'll see you in the next one.